Ephesians chapter number 6 and verse 18, the Bible says, Praying always with all prayer. Yeah. Wow, what about that? And supplication in the Spirit. Boy, he tells us how to pray right in the Spirit. And watching there and too. Keep your eyes open. Yeah. They said one time this church was a praying and uh, or maybe the preacher was up preaching. He said, somebody's getting y'all's coats. And they just sat there like a bunch of dummies. After a while, he said, somebody's getting y'all's coats. You know, back then, they hung their coats in the vestibule. Sure enough, there's a thief back there getting, getting their coats. So I guess it pays to watch, don't it? Watching there in two with all perseverance. I like the way he uses those words, always, in all prayer and all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we want to thank you for the wonderful word of God. We thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for the debt you paid on Calvary's hill that we could live and have eternal life. We pray for the spirit of God to move upon the service today. Move upon thy servant. Give liberty, give unction, give power. Without you we're a sounding brass, we're a tinkling cymbal. And so we need the touch of God today. Bless your people. Stir and challenge each and every one of us and draw us near unto thee. And we'll say thank you and blessed be the name of the Lord. Amen and amen. I want to speak to you today upon intercessory prayer because there are different kind of prayers. You know, I've preached to you on uh, the prayer of repentance. There's the prayer of thanksgiving, the prayer of praise, the prayer of uh, honor and things like that. And so we just need to be conscious of the prayers that uh, the Bible talks about. Well, you know, in prayer we have, we ask for physical needs, we ask for spiritual needs, we ask for financial needs, we ask for uh, uh, domestic needs and universal needs and uh, personal needs and other things and pray for others. And that's what intercessory prayer is, it's praying for others. And so that's what I want to talk to you about a little while today and just give you some folks in the Bible praying for other people. First of all, there's Abraham. The Bible talks about Abraham in the book of Genesis, uh, Genesis chapter 18. And, of course, um, Abraham sat and had some visitors that day. He's sitting out under the oak yeah. at Mamre in his tent, and he was enjoying the... I guess the pleasant air of the oak tree, and he looks up, and there's three men come walking down the road. And he jumps up and takes off and runs and meets them. You know, he's always running, right? He's always running. He runs and greets, greets them and said, come in, come in, come in. He's given the hospitality. The Bible tells us to be given the hospitality. And so he invites them in, and he said, uh, just hang on, and I'll fix you a meal. And, of course, he ran to the herd and got a calf and brought it. And that's, uh, you know, the patience of God. The Bible said God is a God of long suffering. It amazed me that the Lord sat down there and waited on him to fix a meal. And you wonder what the conversation was all about because this was two angels and the Lord Jesus in his theophany's body. And so here they are, three men, two angels and the Lord Jesus himself uh, sitting in the presence of old Abraham. And so uh, you wonder what all the conversation was about. But then we find that the Lord begins to talk about Abraham's faithfulness. He said in verse number 17, I know him. He will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment that the Lord may bring upon Abraham and that which he had promised and spoken of him. So he, he says, Abraham's faithful, and I want to reveal some things. You know, God ain't going to tell you much if you're not faithful. Be thou faithful unto death, and I'll give you a crown. If you're faithful, God can do something with you, <clears throat> and he can use you, and he can tell you things. He can reveal things to you. And so if this had been a man out of fellowship with God, he wouldn't have got the news, would he? But anyway, God said he's faithful, and he testified that. And then, of course, he gets a revelation there in verse number 20 and 21, and he, God said, uh, and the Lord said, because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grievous. You know, the sin of homosexuality is very grievous. It's sodomy, and it's very grievous. I don't care what how they dress it up today. It's like dressing up the pig. You can wash him and put a dress on him and put lipstick on him and put a, a bracelet on him or a necklace or something and just dress him up real good and say, boy, isn't that pig 
beautiful and you open the door and that pig goes out and heads for the first mud hole. That's the way it is, friend. You can dress homosexuality up. You can talk about sodomy all you want to, but God said that's very grievous. He said, I will go down now and see whether they have done altogether according to the cry of it which is come up unto me. If not, I will know. God didn't have to go down to see, but he did, you know, and he was checking this thing out. And, hey, that cry does come up to God Almighty, doesn't it? It surely does. And so Abraham gets a revelation of what God is about to do. And then notice his position. The Bible said in verse 22, and uh, he, the men turned, the two angels turned and left when they told that. And Abraham stood before the Lord. Abraham stood before the Lord. That's what we need to do is stand before the Lord, isn't it? Stand before him, talk to him, believe him and trust him. And they, some things took place as Abraham uh, stood before the Lord there. He said, and Abraham drew near and said, he drew near to the Lord and said, he began to say, with the judge of all the earth, will he destroy the righteous with the wicked because he knew what he was going to do, right? He knew how wicked they was down in Sodom. And he goes on to say, will not the judge of all the earth do right? Amen. I mean, he's telling this to the Lord Jesus. Yeah. Will not the judge of all the earth do right? He always does right. Yeah, he, does. he does right for you. He does right for me. He does right for everybody. And then, then he begins to plead, don't he? He begins to plead. He said, now, Lord, uh, perchance, perchance there's 50 people down there in Sodom that are righteous, will you spare the city of Sodom and Gomorrah if there's 50? And God said, yes, I'll spare it for 50. And he said, well, what about 45? If there's five less than 50, 45, God said, I'll spare it for 45. He said, now, Lord, don't be angry with me. Oh, what about 40? He said, I'll spare it for 40. Oh, what about 30? Well, I'll spare it for 30. What about 20? He said, Lord, don't be angry with me. What about 20? He said, I'll spare it for 20. He said, now, Lord, I know this is really, uh, this is really getting close here, but would you spare it for 10? If you can find 10 righteous people down in Sodom, will you spare it? He knew Lot was down there. His nephew was down there. His family was down there. And evidently, there's more than 10 of them. He thought, surely there are 10 righteous people down there. And God said, I'll spare it for 10. Abraham was pleading for his Nephew Lot, who are you pleading for? Who are you interceding for? He is a praying for Lot, right? Yeah. Then the Bible tells us not only so, but number two, Moses prayed. He prayed for Miriam in Numbers chapter 12 and verse 1 through 13. You know, Miriam and Aaron got to talking about Moses. And they began to talk about that Ethiopian woman that Moses had married. They didn't like that fact that he had married an Ethiopian woman. And God came down and he said, didn't you fear to talk about my servant? You know, people don't fear to run God's preachers down and criticize them and destroy their influence and everything else. You know what you're doing when you destroy a preacher's influence? You're destroying souls that he might be able to win to Christ. You're tearing down. Hey, we ought to be building up instead of tearing down, right? And so the Bible said that she became a leper. She became leprous right there. And he was scared to death. Oh, Moses, 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 do something, pray for her. And Moses did pray for her. And the Bible said, well, you know, uh, if her father had spit in her face, you know, she'd be in shame for it. Said, you're going to have to put her out of the camp for seven days. You're going to have to put her out of the camp for seven days because of what she's done, to let her know what she's done to let all nations know, let all people of generations know that it's uh, one thing when you begin to criticize the God of heaven and the, uh, God's men, God's anointed preachers. It's going to be something, brother. And Moses prayed, and of course God spared her, and she was healed after seven days. But the camp didn't move for seven days. Hey, you know, there's a lot of times people, uh, they hold up the church. Don't be holding up the church. Turn the church loose and let it go. Let it go, amen. Then Moses prayed for the people on the book of Numbers, chapter 21. The Bible said because they was complaining against Moses or against God and against Moses, they're always complaining. Listen, you know, I think they must have been Baptist, don't you? Always a complaining and bellyaching. 
They're always a belly, belly aching about something, always complaining. I don't like this, and I don't like it, and I don't like it, and yeah, they, they, they. But there'll be no grumblers up there, no complainers. <laughs> no siree, brother. And, you know, the Bible said God sent snakes among them. Boy, them snakes begin to bite down people, and they begin to die. And um, they came to Moses and said, pray for us, Moses. Pray, pray. I said, you get rid of these snakes or do something. And Moses prayed, and God said, make a, a brazen servant, put it on a pole. Whoever looks at that servant can be healed. That's a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. Put him on a cross. Look at him. They sing about the cross. Hey, that's what Spurgeon, you know, Spurgeon, mighty Spurgeon, a preacher for, a mighty preacher for 50 or 60 years, I guess. I'm not, no, I don't guess. He, he, he held his church, he held his congregation for 40 years in London. And Spurgeon couldn't understand how to be saved. You know, he'd go to church, he, and he couldn't understand. And one Sunday morning it snowed, and he couldn't get to his regular church, so he went to a little mission, a little Methodist mission, I think it was. They said there's about a dozen people there that morning, and uh, the preacher that normally preached, he couldn't make it because of the snow. So one of the laymen got up, and he read that scripture out of the book of Isaiah. Look and live, look and live, look unto me. And live, and he was preaching that said anybody can look. Said it's not hard to look, and said you can look and live. And he looked down at Spurgeon, and saw he was under conviction. He said, "Young man, look, <laughs> look to Jesus." And Spurgeon said, "Right then, the light broke in his soul, and he was saved because he looked to Jesus." And that's what he was saying. Look to the brazen serpent and you'll be healed. Can you imagine? Some of them said, that's foolishness. That's ridiculous. I'm going to look. And they probably died. But those that looked, they lived. So those that looked to Jesus, they lived. Moses prayed. He prayed for those people. He prayed for um, many times for them, no doubt. But that's just two incidents. Uh, then number three, Elijah, Elijah prayed for Israel in the book of First uh, Kings chapter 18. You know, he met with them on the Mount, of Mount Carmel and went to that great uh, contest with the prophets of Baal. And this is verse number 36. The Bible said in 1 Kings 18, 36, and it came to pass the time of the offer of the evening sacrifice. He knew when the evening sacrifice was supposed to be. Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Israel, let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel and that I am thy servant, that I have done all these things that thy word God told him to. You can't miss when you're operating on the word of God. When you're following the leadership of the Holy Spirit, you can't miss. Hear, O Lord, hear me, O Lord, hear me, that the people may know that thou art the Lord God and thou hast turned their heart back again. Who's he praying for? That people, Israel, he's praying for that people and uh, that, he, that their hearts will be turned back. Then, of course, the fire fell, burnt the sacrifice. The wood, the stones, the water, everything wasn't nothing left. And they said, God, he is God. Jehovah God, he is God. And so he was praying for those people. The Bible says in another place in the book of Romans that he prayed. And uh, the Bible said he prayed against Israel. And so you know what we need to do sometime? We need to pray against this crowd that's what we got to do. We got to pray against wickedness. We can't stand up, put up with the wickedness. We have to pray. Hey, if there's anybody who can get anything done, it's the saints of God, right? The lying crowd, they cover up what they do and they think they're getting by. But after a while, God's going to jerk the cover off of them. There they are, stark naked. And so that's the way it is. God will do it. Then, uh, number four, right quick, Elisha uh, prayed for his servant. And, of course, the king of Syria was trying to uh, war against Israel. And uh, the Lord's telling Elisha, where there's that? And Elisha would tell the king, don't go here. The Syrians are there waiting on you. And one day the king said, now who's, who's siding with Israel? Who's telling them to wherever where we're at? He said, which one of you's betraying us? One of them said, nobody's betraying you said, Elisha, the man of God's telling the king where we're at. 
They said, well, where's he at? He's over in Dothan. Well, go get him. And so the, that night all the Syrians, they came, and the Bible says the mountains were full of them. In verse 15, and when the servant of the man of God that was risen up early and gone forth, behold, and a host compassed the city both with horses and chariots. And, uh, and uh, his servant said uh, unto him, Alas, my master, what shall we do? And he answered, Fear not, for they that be with us are more than, that, than they that be with them. Hey, brother, if you're on the Lord's side, remember you've got all heaven on your side. Jesus said, I could have called 72,000 angels to take me from the cross to defend me if I'd have called on them. Hey, brother, more for us than with them. And so that's great. And look what Elisha prayed and said, Oh, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots a fire round about Elisha. Hey, hey, and when they came down to him, Elisha prayed unto the Lord and said, Smite the people, I pray thee, with blindness. And he smote them with blindness according to the word of Elisha. And Elisha said, Follow me and I'll take you uh, to Samaria. I'll take you to the king. And when they get there, they're right in the middle of Samaria. Hey, he prayed. Does it help to pray? He prayed for his servant. He he couldn't see. You know, a lot of people can't see what you can see and what I can see, right? They don't see it because we got the Holy Spirit to guide us. We got the Word of God to guide us. We got a, a person living on the inside that guides us and directs us. And so Elisha prayed. Then number five, Daniel prayed. Daniel interceded. Daniel was down in the land of Babylon in chapter 9 and verse 16 through uh, 19. And Daniel was praying. He was praying of far Jerusalem because he loved Jerusalem. That was the homeland of the Jews. That was his home before. And so he's down here in the land of Babylon. Oh, Lord, according to all thy righteousness, I beseech thee, let thine anger and my, thy fury be turned away from thy city, Jerusalem. He's praying for the city of Jerusalem. Is he's praying for stones and buildings. No, he's praying for the people of Jerusalem, for the holy mountain, because for our sins and for the iniquities of our father Jerusalem and thy people are become a reproach to all that are about us. Now therefore, God, hear and pr the prayer of thy servant and his supplications and cause thy face to shine upon thy sanctuary that is desolate for the Lord's sake. Oh, my God, incline thine ear and hear open thine eyes and behold our desolation and the city which is called by thy name. For we do not present our supplication before thee for our righteousness, but for thy great mercies. Because, hey, we don't have no righteousness. This is all my righteousness, nothing but the blood of Jesus Christ. I don't have any of my own. It's the blood of Jesus Christ. It is for his great mercy. Oh, Lord, hear. Oh, Lord, forgive. Oh, Lord, hearken and do. Defer not for thine own sake. Oh, my God, for thy city and thy people are called by thy name. He's praying for Jerusalem. And if you go back and look at the date when he prayed that prayer, you go to the book of Haggai. It's the book of Haggai. Six months later, God answered that prayer. Yeah. Hey, God does hear and answer prayer. Yeah, he They're praying. These people are praying for others. These people are praying for others. Okay, I better hurry on because I'll never get done. Because I want to talk to you a few minutes about Jesus praying. Did Jesus intercede for others? You better believe it. He prayed for Peter. The Bible said in the book of Luke chapter 22, verse 31, the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan desires to have you that he may sift you as wheat. Right. Oh, that devil, he wants you. That devil, he wants you. Yeah, he does. I'll tell you a little answer. Carol's daddy stayed with us, you know, and of course, Carol's mother died and uh, her daddy had sit with one of the women and one of the two of the women want to sit with him and and he said one day oh she wants me she wants me <laughs> that devil he wants you friend yeah. he wants you bad sure he, does. he wanted Peter yeah. he said he wants you to 
He wants to sift you as wheat. He wants to really work you over, Peter. But I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not when thou art converted. Strengthen thy brethren. What does he mean when he says when you're converted? Well, I looked up that word converted in Hebrew, uh, Greek, and it means to return. It means to turn about. It means to turn again. It means to come again. It means to revert. In other words, he's going he's to deny the Lord Jesus. And after he does that, he said, you're going to turn around. You're going to get right. You're going to repent. Then he said, uh, take care of the brethren. Strengthen the brethren. Hey, Jesus is praying, right? He prayed for Peter. He interceded. You see, that's the reason we need to intercede for others, right? You say, what in the world are you preaching a sermon like that for? Because the Lord put it on my heart, that's why. Hey, it, not only that, he prayed for his disciples in the book of John 17. He prayed a pretty long prayer for them, didn't he? John 17, the Bible says, uh, let me go back and read verse 6. I have manifest thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them me. They have kept thy word. Now they have known that all things whatsoever thou hast given me are of thee, for I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I came out from thee, and they have believed that thou didst send me. I pray for them. I pray for them, for the disciples. I pray not for the world. As I've told you one time, when I read that one time, of course I read it a lot of times. Sometimes things just don't dawn on you like they, like they should, right? But he said, uh, I pray not for the world. You know why? If Jesus prayed for the world, they'd all been saved. But God don't save people against their will. If you want to go to hell and you're determined to go to hell, he'll let you go. God made man a free moral agent. And he said, choose whom you will serve, whether the gods of the past, the gods that they father served, or the God of heaven. Choose this day whom you will serve. And so you've got to choose. Man is a free moral agent with the power to choose. He has a will to choose. He can live for the devil. He can live for God, either one he chooses to. And so, beloved, you've got to choose. Which will it be? Will you choose life? Will you choose Christ? Or will you choose the devil? And so the Bible says, I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine, and all mine are thine, and thine are mine. I am glorified in them, and now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world. He's fixing to leave out. That's what he's talking about. And he says, and I come to thee, Holy Father, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are one. So he prayed for his disciples. Now you think about what if he hadn't have prayed for them? What happened when uh, he was crucified? The Bible said you smite the shepherd and the sheep were scattered. Yeah. They were scattered. Man, there's afraid. There's afraid they was going to be crucified because they followed the Lord Jesus. They were his disciples. And so the Lord prayed for them. He prayed for them to be faithful and to be uh, still on the track, right? Then not only so, but he prayed for you and me. In John 17, 20, the Bible said, Neither pray I for these alone. He's not praying altogether for the disciples, but for them also which shall believe on me through thy word. Jesus prayed for you and for me. He prayed for you. You believed on him. He prayed for you. Hey, he, he always got his prayers answered. Every prayer he ever prayed, he got it answered. Now, you prayed a lot of prayers, and I probably have too. And we've all prayed prayers that didn't get above the ceiling. But I'll tell you what, every prayer he ever prayed was answered. He prayed for them that would believe. Thank God he prayed for me. Yes, sir. Oh, isn't that beautiful? And the Bible says, well, what did he pray for? Well, one thing in John 14, 16, I will pray the Father and he shall give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. Hey, we got a comforter that lives on the inside is going to live with us forever and ever and ever and ever. What about that? That, that wasn't the only thing he prayed for. He prayed for some other things too, didn't he? He surely did. He, he prayed that, uh, he said in Isaiah 53, 12, therefore I, 
will I divide him a portion of the great. He shall divide the spoil of the strong because he hath poured out his soul unto death. He was done with the transgressor and the bear of the sins of many and made intercession for the transgressors. He made intercession for you and for me, right? He says in the book of Romans chapter 8 verse 31, what shall we say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? If God is for you, who can be against you? You say there's a lot of people against me. Hey, well, he's standing for you. He's going to give you victory. The Bible says, he, he that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Hey, God is a, he's, a, he's not a tight wad. He's not a skint flint. He gives freely, right? The Bible said, who shall lay anything to God's elect? It is God that justifies. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died. Yea, rather that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Do you know he's still praying for you? He's standing up for you. He's intervening for you. When that old devil, you know the devil's the accuser of the brother, right? When he accuses you, Jesus is there to defend you. He's the lawyer that stands up for you. Praise God, he knows how to talk to Amen. Yes, sir. Not only so, the Bible says the Spirit maketh intercession for us. In the book of Romans chapter 8 and verse 26, the Bible said, Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought. We don't know how to pray sometimes, do we? As we ought to. But the Spirit itself makes an intercession for us with groaning which cannot be uttered. What about that? The Spirit makes intercession. <clears throat> and he that searches the heart knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit because he maketh an intercession for the saints according to the will of God. We've got somebody that's a praying for us. Somebody that's standing for us. Somebody that's helping us. What a blessing that is. And then number seven, we are to pray for others, right? This is what the Bible says. And I, I've certainly not got everything the Bible tells us to pray for, but uh, just a few things. The Bible said in Matthew 5, 44, them which despitefully use you and persecute you, you're to pray for them. That's kind of hard to do, is it? They despise you. They criticize you. Sometimes people persecute you. Some of those people in communist prisons, even in when Hitler was killing all the Jews, there's a few stories that came out of those praying for their torturers and their people that was over them, that treated them so cruelly they prayed for them. That's the love of Jesus Christ. Yeah. That's the wonderful grace of God that causes you to do that. You couldn't do it without him. Matthew 9, 28, Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth labors into his harvest. We're to pray God send labors into the harvest. That's one of the prayers that the saints need to pray for. Intercede for God to send labors in to his vineyard. The harvest is right, but the labors are few. Lift up your eyes and look on the fields everywhere you go. Everywhere you go, there's souls that's lost. Everywhere you go, there's people that don't know the Lord Jesus. I mean, there's just doors fly open to you if you're looking for those doors. But doors can be wide open. You don't even see them. But it's a wonderful thing if you've got your eyes open and you're ready. You're always ready. You're ready to pass out a track. You're ready to give a witness. You're ready to speak up for Jesus. I mean, you're always ready. You're looking for that opportunity because it comes again and again and again and again. And what a beautiful thing that is when you have that opportunity. Sometimes say, people say, what's your name? I say, well, let me give it to you. Right here. It's got my name on this track. Hey, there's just all kind of ways. People say, say where's old so-and-so live? Give him a track. Where do you work at? Give him a track. Hey, be ready, be ready. Pray that the Lord will send labors into his vineyard. We need labors. We need workers. You, would you agree, Zion? Yeah. Do we need labors? Yeah. Do we need workers? Yeah. yeah, we do. We need the beach warmers, yeah. We need ameners, yes. We need shouters, yes. We need givers, yes. We need door knockers, yes. We need track passer-outers, yes. We just need everybody. 
The harvest is great, but the labors are few. And so we need to pray, oh, God, send labors into your vineyard. It's your business, dear God. It's your business. Oh, it's your business. Lord, we need to do it. And then the Bible said we're to pray for folk to be healed. In the book of James, chapter 5, verse 16, pray one for another that you may be healed. And I'm glad Zion does that. A lot of churches never pray for anybody that's sick. They may read a list that long. And uh, I don't know whether they pray or not. God's the, he's the witness. I'm not a witness. I'm not a judge if they, if they pray or not. But anyway, I'm glad that folks can come and we'll pray for them and get around. And we've seen God do some mighty things. We've seen God heal. We've seen God do it. Hey, he just keeps on to doing it because he loves to do it. And then the Bible tells us to pray again for somebody else, a sinning brother. A sinning brother in the book of First John chapter 5, verse 16. If any man, any man see his brother sin a sin which is not unto death. If you see somebody that sins a sin which is not unto death. There's some sins unto death. Yeah. You know that, don't you? Yeah. He shall ask and he, God shall give him life. And that's for them that sin not unto death. If you see somebody sin a sin that's not unto death, then you're to pray for them and ask God to cleanse them, wash them, clean them up, forgive them. And he'll give them life, he said. That's what John was saying right there. Then let me read on the verse that says something else. There is a sin unto death. There is a sin unto death. Yeah. And when you commit that sin unto death, friend, you're going out of here. Right. All the king's horses and all the king's men right. can't keep you here. In fact, in the book of Jeremiah, the Jeremiah was told by God, don't pray for these people. I won't hear you. Don't intercede for them. I won't hear you. There comes a time there's no use to pray. If people step over God's deadline, and Dr. J. Harold Smith, I heard him preach that sermon, God's Deadlines, Three Deadlines, I think is the title of it. And he said he had seen that the last time I heard him preach it, he had seen 14 or 16 people that committed the unpardonable sin. He said they died within 24 hours of committing that sin. They committed a sin unto death. God said he'll forgive every sin, but that's one sin he won't forgive. It is blasphemy against the Holy Ghost. He won't forgive in this world, nor in the world to come. He said there is a sin unto death, and he shall not pray for it. They no use to pray. But we're to pray for others, right? Then last of all, number eight, the rich man in hell, he prayed. Did you know that? Folk in hell. There's one prayer he didn't pray. He didn't say, Abraham, can't you get me out of here? I want to get out of this place that tore me. I want to get out of here. No, he didn't say that. Isn't that amazing? He didn't beg to get out, didn't pray to get out. He didn't say, I deserve to get out. Hadn't done Anything worthy to be in this awful place? He didn't say that, did he? He prayed for Abraham to send Lazarus, dip his finger in water and touch my tongue for I'm tormented in this flame. He said, I'm sorry. There's a guff fixed between you and me. Nobody can pass over that guff. I'm sorry. He said, Father Abraham, i got five brothers. Send Lazarus back. And he may tell them not to come to this place of torment. The rich man in hell is concerned about his five brothers. He's interceding for his brothers. But you know what the answer was? They have Moses and the prophets. They have the word of God. And if they won't believe them, they wouldn't believe the one rose from the dead. And the Jews still do not believe on the whole that Jesus is the Christ and is risen from the dead. There's people who don't believe that Jesus is risen from the dead, but he has. We know he has. Thank God he lives on the inside of us. Thank God through the person of the Holy Spirit of God. It's time to intercede. It's time to pray for others. Yeah, we need to pray for ourselves. There's no doubt about that. But it's time to pray for others. It's time to pray for your children. It's time to pray for your grandchildren. It's time to pray for sinners. We 
and make these requests all the time. We do it all the time. And we need to pray for others earnestly, sincerely.